Western nations have been trying to help Ukraine for two years now. While finances and arms aid have been ample, it seems that may not be enough to actually liberate the occupied areas. More direct military involvement may be needed for that. So this video asks, what sort of military help would be needed at a minimum to truly help Ukraine liberate its territories and ultimately retake Crimea? This video will cover some political nuances and options, as well as several options for actually sending NATO personnel to Ukraine and fighting for Ukraine using NATO equipment. The video will not explore the option of total NATO war on Russia. Sure, NATO is strong enough to remove Russia from Ukraine if it goes all in, but that might very well result in nuclear war. Instead, the video will cover more nuanced solutions. What's the minimum NATO involvement needed to liberate Ukraine? without going too far politically. Zelensky recently said 31,000 Ukrainian troops lost their lives. But it's not easy to keep track of all the news in today's media landscape. Different sources will vary drastically about the information they release. Today's sponsor Ground News can help get a more clear and nuanced picture. You can check it out at ground.news binkov in the link below. Ground News is an app and a website that gathers articles from across the world. They also have a Ukraine interests page so you can get a more transparent look at the conflict. That piece of news with Ukraine's official casualty count was covered by 300 articles. Ground News even shows Russian state media sources, which gives you an insight into what their motives might be. Curiously, most of the coverage is coming from the center and the left, which we can see being broken down in this biased distribution chart. Besides that, each media source has a factuality rating, which comes from two independent media organizations. Ownership of each source is also visible here. Some two-thirds of the media reporting on this news was from corporations and government sources. I always love looking at who reports what and who owns what, as that can provide insight into their objectivity. Ground News helps track the ever-changing geopolitical landscape. I highly recommend you check it out by going to ground.news. Their plans start as little as $1 per month, but if you click my link down below, you'll get 30% off their unlimited access vantage plan, which is what I use for myself. After two years, it seems as if Russia is slowly getting an upper hand. That may or may not be enough for Russia to start taking further large chunks of Ukraine's territory. But it certainly seems to preclude Ukraine from retaking already lost territory, unless NATO joins the fight more directly. So what does Ukraine lack now? And how might NATO help there? For all its inefficiencies, the Russian Air Force is still dominant. While it's been largely prevented from going beyond the front lines, even the frontline work is at times hitting Ukraine pretty hard. Ukraine needs a way to keep those Russian aircraft away from delivering weapons at the front lines. Basically, to shoot down most aircraft when they're even a few dozen miles away from the front lines. Currently, with no air force and with limited means of monitoring the low altitudes near the front line, Ukraine can't do that. Also, Ukraine today can't really engage Russian missiles and artillery on the ground as well as it did a year ago. There were reports that Russia is back at grouping their artillery guns, as that increases their effectiveness. Previously, Russia had to disperse their units as Ukraine was hunting those down. Ukraine is low on ammunition, like guided missiles for HIMARS launchers. It's definitely low on artillery shells, and it may be getting low on artillery pieces themselves. Ukraine needs a way to suppress Russian guns, rocket launchers and loitering munitions operating up to a few dozen miles away from the front line, while at the same time continuously shelling the Russian front lines before an attack. It also needs to neutralize most medium-sized drones observing the battlefield. Once that's done, a ground push into said enemy front line could be made more effective. It could even have time to deal with extensive minefields. The reasons why NATO has not helped with all those are political and economic. Economy-wise, well, it's basically a foregone conclusion. If NATO is to really help Ukraine, its countries will need to invest much more in Ukraine than they did so far. Since this video goes even further into a hypothetical NATO engagement, we'll just assume the political will to endure those economic costs is there, before any military intervention starts. Now, the politics of military involvement are very delicate. We've seen quite specific rules implemented as is. The US and the West did send long-range missiles to Ukraine, 
but forbade Ukraine from using those weapons on Russian soil. So Ukraine is making do with makeshift kamikaze drones in small numbers for such missions. Now the big political risk is nuclear escalation. While Putin has been threatening with that in vague terms since the start of the war, so far nothing NATO countries did has in fact resulted in nuke usage. Which makes it plausible that for as long as NATO slowly keeps adding its forces in indirect ways, Russia would be hard pressed to actually use a nuke. Of course that's no guarantee, but this video will simply proceed with such a premise as we are making a hypothetical video. So could NATO go about denying Russia air power while also utilizing the skies more for both recon and airstrikes? So far most of the air defense systems delivered to Ukraine have not been taken out of NATO's country's active service arsenals. Instead newly produced SAMs have been delivered, but given the issue of ramping up production and limited funds allocated, those have not been as plentiful as they could have been. Also old reserve stocks of SAM systems have been sent, their efficiency leaves a lot to be desired. Furthermore, those stocks are usually limited and can't yield dozens of SAM systems. So a serious NATO push to fight for skies over Ukraine would definitely have to involve actual active service SAM systems in much greater numbers. A dozen US Patriot batteries would be a decent start. So far the US has been willing to part ways with just one such battery. Those would be joined by many other SAM batteries of different types some sourced from other countries, while others simply bought as new from manufacturers. Much more money allocated to Ukraine could increase production pace for new built systems. Training to use SAM systems could be done fairly quickly, certainly within the time it takes to deliver those to Ukraine. But ground radars and ground-based SAM batteries can't do all the work. Even with NATO replacing items lost to Russia with new ones, there's still the issue of radar horizon. A SAM can't shoot what it can't see, and a low-flying plane flying 300 feet off the ground is gonna be spotted just some 30 miles away from the radar. Radar itself can't be right on the front line. It needs to be deeper inside Ukraine's lines to be protected from artillery and loitering munitions. So what's left is not much power projection over the front line itself. Russia is still able to fly fairly close to the front line and fire off missiles from aircraft. That's why NATO would need to focus on the aircraft. Right now Ukraine is poised to get a few dozen F-16s during this year. It can't really fly more right away as it lacks pilots. And pilots can't really be trained within a year from scratch to be effective. So if NATO was serious about an air war in Ukraine, it would allocate many more planes. Instead of sending just 1990s technology F-16 variants, it would also put the best and newest F-16s to use, the V variant. Those would be sacrificed by NATO members, so to say, US mostly. There is currently capacity to build new and modernize old F-16s to set standard at over 50 airframes per year. That would have to be increased in the long run, of course. Within a year or two, most would be older airframes upgraded to V standard. In this case, nearly all should be redirected to Ukraine. A few hundred F-16s would not be enough on their own, so NATO would want to operate some F-35s as well. We'd be talking about a three-plane type force, some hundred older F-16s which are basically the ones being delivered to Ukraine as it is. Those would be delivering standoff weapons, doing missions where they would be fairly far away from threats. Upgraded F-16s would help beef up F-35 numbers, probably a few hundred of those would be needed and upward of 100 F-35s to be the tip of the spear, doing risky near frontline attacks, destroying some of the enemy SAM sites and intercepting Russian air incursions. While something like 500 jets might seem a lot, for a country the size of Ukraine it's really not. Just to maintain air patrols over most of Ukraine, a few dozen planes might need to be rotated in the air. That alone might require 150 F-16s on station. Air losses would be unavoidable not just from air combat, but more often from Russian strikes on Ukrainian bases. That means, over time, more than 500 jets used. Ideally, everyone would want to go in with as large force as possible, so even 2,000 combat planes would be desirable against Russia. But with the indirect approach, finding enough volunteer crews and basing many more planes inside Ukraine might be too hard. The Russian Air Force is considerable, and it is geared towards air combat more than towards ground strikes. 
so a sizable NATO force would need to be maintained to just clear the skies of Russian planes, hence the need for 500 plus jets. The US alone has roughly 3000 combat planes, so providing most of the 500 to Ukraine would in theory be doable, if politics allow it. There would have to be plenty of weapons involved as well, to go with those planes. Large chunks of US missile stocks would be needed. Stuff like the newest AARGMER for F-35s and advanced harms for F-16s. Those are anti-radar systems. Also a few thousand cruise missiles, tens of thousands of standoff bombs like SDBs and Stormbreakers, and likely greatly increased production of winged JDAMs that are sent to Ukraine as it is. But crucially, added recon and surveillance platforms would be needed. F-16s would utilize radar-based recon pods like the Dragoneye, as well as optical recon pods like the DB-110. Of course, modern radars on jets can be used to synthesize images from long distances. That would be another addition, but still likely not enough. So far, the biggest recon drone Ukraine has been using is the TB-2. The bigger the drone, the bigger the optics it can carry, meaning longer range achieved and not risking the drone itself. A Reaper's optical MTS-B sensor sports a mirror roughly 50% larger in diameter than the MX-15 sensor of the Bayraktar, resulting in roughly a similar 50% increase in recon range. Reapers can also carry radar recon pods, but even all that might not be enough. It's possible NATO might go for actual AWACS-type planes as well, to monitor the skies for hundreds of miles. Perhaps even the US best and latest recon drones like the super stealthy and secretive so-called RQ-180 might fly over Ukraine as well. There we come to an interesting political conundrum. So far Ukrainian planes have sometimes been repaired and upgraded outside Ukraine, but generally they were based in Ukraine, certainly when going to combat missions they were taking off from Ukraine. Having hundreds of US jets flying from Ukraine necessarily means some would get spotted and destroyed on the ground. A logical move might be to simply fly some of them from NATO countries. So far that hasn't been done, as NATO fears that might encourage Russia to attack those countries. But when we're talking about NATO participating in the war more openly, such types of limitations might get blurred. Russia can't really monitor the border between Ukraine, Poland and Hungary. It doesn't know when planes are overflying it. Of course, planes prepped for quick reaction would have to be stationed inside Ukraine as there would simply be no time to react otherwise. NATO might even try to do a middle-of-the-road solution and have high-end planes like the F-35 stationed outside Ukraine, but then have them fly in for a short pit stop at some makeshift base inside Ukraine just to perform a mission. While Reapers could easily operate from within Ukraine, even if piloted remotely by US personnel, aircraft like the AWACS and the RQ-180 would likely not be risked that way. Those would take off from well inside NATO, come to Ukraine's border, get refueled in air if needed and perform their surveillance or recon mission inside Ukraine. That would certainly be seen as an escalation by Russia, but as we said, many Russian red lines have already been crossed. NATO has already been flying their drones and planes at times just tens of miles away from Russian territory, over the Black Sea. So while Russia would of course be trying to shoot down any such plane, it's far from assured it would try to strike bases inside NATO countries. Such escalation could only lead to even more direct NATO involvement, which Russia does not want. Naturally, NATO planes themselves would still not strike Russian bases outside Ukraine. They could leave enough of a mark striking ground targets inside Ukraine, Russian planes that happen to be inside Ukraine, and Russian planes shooting even if technically within Russian borders. Of course, so many planes necessarily means non-Ukrainian pilots, and a few tens of thousands of support personnel on the ground. While some of all those pilots and support staff could be Ukrainian, the majority would be NATO. Or if that is deemed to be too much of an escalation, they would be ex-NATO, basically mercenaries, paid by Ukraine. But as NATO countries would be funding Ukraine itself, much more than now, in the end they would be paid for by NATO countries. Still, such an indirect payment and indirect affiliation might be enough not to stir up an escalation. Mercenary pilots have had a long history. The Soviet Union sometimes sent their pilots to fight in other countries' wars. Korean War, Israeli-Arab Wars, possibly Vietnam War. 
and even in the more modern times ex-Russian Air Force pilots were possibly fighting in Ethiopia. Air power alone would not be enough to dish out enough destruction though. It simply lacks persistence, reaction time and its weapons are too expensive and not available to be used in the numbers required, so further NATO volunteers slash mercenaries would be needed to help operate ground systems. Those would perhaps not fully man vehicles, but an experienced crew member might help green Ukrainian crews. Experienced maintenance crews might help take care of vehicles between deployments. We're talking about various HIMARS and MLRS vehicles, but also many, many artillery systems. That of course requires NATO countries parting ways with most of their ammunition and not stocking it up. The US actually did have between 4.5 and, and 6,155mm artillery shells stocked before the war. A little over 2 million were sent to Ukraine, and during the two years of the war the US produced close to half a million more. Also stuff like Atakams missiles and even brand new PRISM missiles would need to be used liberally, not saved up. GMLRS missiles, of which the US seems to have sent roughly a quarter to a fifth of its arsenal to Ukraine, would also need to be spent in much greater numbers. Russia has slowly been eroding Ukraine's artillery as well, hunting down artillery pieces one by one. It's likely a thousand or more additional M109 and other artillery pieces would need to be sent to Ukraine. M109 is far from the best system, but it's the most available one and could be sent in large quantities quickly. Mostly operated by Ukrainian crews, but possibly maintained and helped by NATO volunteers slash mercenaries. By using ex-NATO personnel in less exposed roles, farther from the front lines, there would be much fewer casualties for NATO. That's likely to be important for two reasons. One, it would cause less domestic uproar in the US and Europe if fewer US and EU citizens died. It would cause less uproar if those are volunteers who went to Ukraine to earn large amounts of money. And it would be harder for Russia to make a fuss about the exact number of Western personnel operating in Ukraine if their deaths would not happen often. But rest assured, some of those volunteers would cost dearly, possibly millions per year when it comes to highly skilled individuals like fighter pilots. There simply would not be any other way to entice enough people to drop their NATO careers and fly as mercenaries. NATO or ex-NATO personnel would be some distance away from the front lines. And it's possible the entire NATO contingent would be maintained at just tens of thousands of personnel. Also, you can't wage war effectively without hitting enemy bases, logistics depots and factories, meaning facilities inside Russia, not just in Crimea. Ukraine has been trying to do that, but it has too few weapons to make a proper, sustained, mass-scale campaign out of it. While NATO could still maintain the pretext of indirect involvement by still not using its missiles for targets inside Russia, it would have to do much more when it comes to enabling Ukraine. Basically, a cheap cruise missile or even a kamikaze drone would have to be devised. Its components mass-produced at insane numbers in the West, then shipped to Ukraine for final assembly. It would just have a Made in Ukraine label slapped onto it, while still keeping a thin veil of, hey, it's not a NATO missile. Plus, it's basically the same thing Russia has been doing with its uranium-sourced munitions. It would hardly cause an escalation. Such a weapon currently does not exist in the West, but a crude Shahid-like long-range munition could be devised probably within months, if not a year. Without such cheap weapons, even NATO might simply lack guided munition numbers to do a campaign against Russia without risking many more lives than needed. But even after all the added recon capabilities, after all the added firepower, it would still be Ukrainian troops fighting on the very front lines. While Ukraine is having issues with manpower, it's still something money could help solve. Zelensky recently said that half a million more mobilized soldiers is a problem, as three million more workers would have to be found somewhere to pay for all those additional troops. The solution might be the Western countries totally taking over Ukraine's finances and Ukraine's economy. Right now, Ukraine is short roughly 50% of its government expenditures, with the West covering the other half. What we're talking about here is that the West basically starts sending huge amounts of food and other necessities, alongside much more money. So fewer Ukrainians need to work to simply upkeep the military, resulting in more Ukrainians available to fight. 
Of course, those troops too would need to be well paid to be willing to fight. So it would be a pricey endeavor. But as we said in our previous videos, the West is still far from spending the amounts of money on Ukraine, which would be comparable to other wars. In World War II, the US was spending 25 times more per year. It's plausible the forces outlined so far would be enough to eventually wear out Russia, slowly but surely. There is really no other way, as any quick and massive escalation, any big and sudden movement might more easily cause nuclear escalation. But if Russia is met with gradual shifts on the front, performed over a few years, it would be hard-pressed to find a red line to use nukes. The option of NATO openly sending hundreds of thousands of its own troops in Ukraine would yield only somewhat different results. We'd need to disregard the nuclear variable, of course. Many more planes would be used, flying directly from NATO countries. At least some of those planes would operate from Ukraine itself. Still a huge chunk of NATO's missile and artillery units and ammo would be used. Instead of paying Ukraine for somehow supporting an extra half a million troops, NATO would be the one sending those troops, which would be much better trained, so that's something that should yield a bit better progress on the battlefield. Biggest difference would be that instead of a few years of gradual escalation and prep, such an offensive could be prepped within half a year, ultimately saving some lives. And it would be somewhat cheaper to organize. Of course, downsides are numerous. The nuke threat would be much bigger. The political will to withstand possibly a few hundred thousand casualties in NATO countries might be questionable. Missile arsenals would still be left mostly empty after such a war. And that's in part why any of this is simply not likely. Either the open offensive or the more covert indirect one. The political will, the consensus in the West to spend so much more over a few more years, does not exist. Furthermore, the US has carefully chosen not to spend too much of its ammo and missile stocks, saving up most for a possible China contingency. It doesn't want to showcase F-35 radar signature in detail to the enemy either. It wants to save that against China. Expecting that to change is unlikely. So NATO intervention in Ukraine, despite the fact it could be made to look quite indirect, and despite the fact perhaps just thousands of NATO troops might be lost, is still in the hypothetical realm. That's it for this video. We do wonder how it will do and where the audience for it will come from. We thought we might share some stats with you, our fans, more often. For example, our previous video on Russia's fighter jet production had 28% of views come from the US, with another 17% coming from UK, Canada and Australia. Views from Russia amounted to barely 2%. The usual percentages for our channel are 50% for the four Western countries and just 1% for Russia. Of course, Russian center topic will do that. We'll see about NATO center topic for this video. Also, we made a poll on our community page about sponsor ad placements. So we'd appreciate it if you took part of that. The link should appear on screen. And until next video, salutations. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.